So, yeah. All right, if you are here today, you are here for the manners group class. So we had a puppy start right with specifically for dogs that are eight to about 20 weeks um, and for owners that haven't even gotten their dog and they wanna get that information ahead of time. So this particular class is the class that we were teaching at Saturday in the morning for our students and for um, for some of our clients that already have some basic skills. So if you're new, um, no worries. We might be um, discussing some stuff that you're not sure about. You can use the chat um, over on your um, screen. There's a chat button or a Q&A where you can ask us a question. If it's relevant to what we're talking about, we'll answer it right away. If it's not relevant and we're going to discuss it a little bit later, we have in a whole section where we'll go through each question and try to answer as many as possible. Um, you are going to be muted. So again, we can't see or hear you. But if you want to ask a question, just use that chat. The class will run for approximately, try to cut it right down to a little bit less than an hour. We, we have three classes today, so we're going to, Julie and I are gonna be teaching um, back and forth. When, um, when I'm teaching, you'll hear my voice and then Julie will go into, and we're gonna just kind of go through sharing our screen, which is the webinar that we have um, made out for you. It's got a lot of fun, interactive videos. This class is going to be recorded, so even if you register but you can't make it for the live class, it's recorded so that you can see it later on. So just so that we know that you're there, can you go ahead and just uh, go into your little chat or your Q&A and type in your name and maybe either where you're from or what your dog's name is. That would be cool. I hear you guys typing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Julie, do you see those questions? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll let you go ahead and um, answer those. So I'm not seeing questions. Oh, there's a Q and an A. And then the chat. Um, so welcome, Linda from Manhattan Beach, Phoebe's mom. Um, oh, we have Aria's mom, Nisha, and Leo, the dad. Um, we're happy to have our Border Collie friend from Shelby, oh, Ru Ruby, the German Shepherd Border Collie mix. Wow, that's a Shelby high energy. and Thomas are from my BNI group. Thank you so much yes. for your support. I love that you're here. That's awesome. We're all kind of Katie, supporting you over this time of year. Willa, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Julie. My dogs are Opal Blossom and Cooper Jedi. I'm from the South, so all of our dogs have two names. Um, but we're really excited to have you guys here. Uh, you want to introduce your dog, who's already on the screen? Um, I'm Yoram Mendaris. I'm the owner and founder of Canine Learning Academy. And we really, really appreciate your help and your support right now while we uh, get through this quarantine. Uh, my dog Bentley is featured in a lot of videos because a lot of our videos are shot right here in my house. <laughs> so uh, it's real easy to use him. But we had been building a, um, a course that wasn't supposed to launch till May anyway. So we have so much awesome video content and easy ways to break it down. So um, thankfully we're just rushing and trying to get the content out there. If you haven't done so already, I really highly recommend joining our Facebook group page, totally free. It's a private page and we're posting a lot of our videos that we show here in the webinars. Uh, we, are, we have four online classes. We have the Puppy Start Right, eight to 20 week old puppies. We also have this Manners in the Real World that we're gonna have ongoing. That's for dogs that have gone through our school program that um, we have six levels that we give each dog level three and four is what usually the dogs graduate where they can do the behavior in public, but not necessarily at a dog park. So that's where a lot of dogs and owners get stuck. Um, the other class we have tonight right after this is the Rowdy Rover. So if you have a reactive dog that reacts to other dogs specifically on leash, we're helping those parents um, get their dog to settle in the home because it's strange to have you home all day. And, um, and how to work with the, the reaction and outside in the real world. And then the next class that we're launching, I think it starts next week, is the Canine Good Citizen um, prep course. 
And uh, we just got authorization from the AKC that we can do an online course for tricks. So we can actually give you your trick certificate right here online, which is pretty cool. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, today's topics, we're gonna discuss the training tools so that you know, you know what to have before you get started. Um, I like to put my stuff on and it kind of tells my dog, hey, you ready to work? Versus just kind of sneaking up on them. Um, different kinds of toys and how they're used and where to put them. Um, breed specific play. Julie's got a great little video that she's gonna show you on how we assess um, breeds. We've got lots of different types of puppies and dogs coming in. So we do research what, what the dog is known for. Um, now, obviously that's not all that they're gonna do, but we want to um, know specifically what the dog was bred to do. Um, we're gonna talk management, leashing versus tethering, and we're going to explain and teach you the difference between spot, plate, settle, crate, mark, what else is there, Julie? Bed. Bed, yeah. So we're gonna teach all the steps on how to teach all of those, but specifically with the settle on the mat. And then one of my favorites um, that we're also gonna go over in the Rowdy Rover class is the problem prevention of having your dog dash like out the door when the door is open. So we're gonna go on showing you how to prevent your dog from dashing out the door and how to encourage your dog to stay in a spot instead. All right, so the different training tools. I'll let Julie go from here. Yeah, so um, this is what we like to have ready when you know I'm setting up my, my training session, especially with my dog, no matter how old she is. We love to do short, fun training sessions. So I always have my harness and leash ready to go, um, different kinds of leashes. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, a settle mat or a blanket, especially if you're working with a young puppy or if you're going outside, it's nice to just have that default space of this is where we're working, this is gonna be our space for right now. Um, and for you to get down on their level because it's really hard for a dog to focus when they're staring at you with their head all the way back and their eyes are big and open. So getting down on their level and actually being on the towel or the mat with them is very helpful. You're also going to need a special mat or blanket for the settle on the mat today. And so you'll go into that a little bit later. We use a clicker. So a clicker is a mark. Um, you'll hear us talking about marking. We either say a verbal yes or we click. Um, the clicker is a translation device. So if we think about how our dogs don't speak English, they speak body language. Um, and we are trying to match our words, our skills, sit down, come stay, with their physical language. Um, and so this is a really great way to identify, hey, what I, the word I just said is what you just did. And that was what I wanted. Um, it's a really precision instrument that we can move really quickly if you have good mechanics. Um, and then of course, treat pouch, some high value treats. And then um, we have some yummy treats. And if you're still potty training your puppy, having a mason jar, or if you're working by the door, having a mason jar of treats so that your dog can't jump up and knock them over, but they're there right when you need them um, is really helpful in the home. Yeah, it's one of the suggestions I do when I first go into a per, um, someone's home, we'll put a mason jar by the front door if we're working on um, front door skills or at the potty station. So having little tiny containers of food all over the place and toys really helps to help you reinforce that behavior right away while you're there. Up high, up high where your dog can't reach them. Yes. Always remember that part, up high. <laughs> Especially for Phoebe. <laughs> dogs that have all of a sudden learned how tall they are, right? So there are lots of different types of toys. Um, we pretty much put them into four or five different categories. And I'm going to go through this video and talk over it. The interactive toy is how we teach a dog a behavior like get, hold, take, drop fetch basically <laughs> all of that can be topped with interactive toys i like toys that squeak and then have something dangling that the dog can can grab onto now if you've got a small puppy that's got a small mouth you're going to want smaller toys and if you've got a dog with a bigger mouth you can then start to have bigger toys so you don't want to grab a big huge soccer ball for a four pound puppy you want to have specifically what fits with their mouth 
This is one of my favorites, the little Kong toy. It looks like an octopus. It's got little flat, little things on there. I think it's called a this wubba. A wubba, yeah. Yeah, that's what, it, that's what they call it, yeah. Ropes, small ropes. Um, this is JD. When we do teach um, how to engage with toys, we do get on the dog's level. You'll see here, uh, I'm on my knees, but when I first started out with her, I was like literally belly down working with her. And before we integrate with toys, we start with just human play, having the dog follow our hands and be okay with us. We can't just like sit down with the dog and then throw out a toy and expect them to, to be okay with that. We wanna go through those steps. So on the Facebook page, we did post a video of what human play looks like. Um, and I got a cute one of, of Bentley and I playing when, on our break today. But so interactive toys is, is what we can use to play and, and train different behaviors. Self-amusement toys is something that you would give your dog to say, you know what, would you please just leave me alone for a second and go do something? It's something that goes in their mouth, like a chew bone. This is, you've got all different types of bones. Some of them are non-food. It's something that your dog likes to chew on, usually supervised, right? You don't want to leave your dog there um, alone, unattended. So just like dogs don't come speaking our language, they don't necessarily know how to play with the toys or the items that we're just like, okay, go play. Why won't they play with these toys? Well, they may not know exactly how to use a tennis ball, exactly how to use a rope toy. So um, it's important for you as the human to show them what you want them to do with the toy, not just, here you go and leave the room because um, that's it's confusing for a dog, just like you have to teach a kid how to play really nicely and properly as well. And how we do that is again, once the dog has you've bonded and trusted, the, the dog has trust in you, you'll get back down to the dog's level and you present the toy, you know, whether it's a, you know, a farther away from them or jiggle it, but you do want to make it a little interesting before you just leave it with them. The comfort toys like the stuffed animals, we do not recommend for certain breeds that are known for pulling the ears off and shaking. Um, we don't want them to practice that, but there are some dogs that do well with stuffed animals, um, even if they've got squeakers in them. We use the comfort toys more for bedtime at night when they're sleeping, they're completely exhausted and you can put it in their, in their crate or their bed um, when they sleep. Or if you need a redirection from your your arms, some of you have young puppies. This is a great thing to say, oh, this feels just like my arm, so go for this, right? Um, once you understand the different categories of toys, and we'll have this again in a PDF file somewhere on, on, on our page, putting everything away and only taking out whatever you want to work on at that time. So if you want to be left alone and you're working on the computer and your dog is in the same room, you're going to have a chew toy. If you want to get down on the floor and play with them, then you're going to use an interactive toy. We also have enrichment feeders, which is a feeding toy, which allows them to be completely by themselves and like solve a puzzle of some kind. So these are our breed groups. These are defined by the AKC. So there's actually, you know, dozens and dozens of of different organizations that we can put our dogs into, but these are the six main one. There's a seventh one, hounds, but not many of us have hounds in the city. Um, so that we're just gonna kind of breeze over that one. Um, no offense, hound dogs. Today, we're gonna specifically be talking about my favorite, which is the herding group. So um, this is gonna be dogs that are specifically made for herding like corgis, like Australian shepherds, like sheep dogs. Um, any Border collies are a big one. Yeah, so if you notice that your dog um, is typically trying to round things up, even sometimes nipping at your heels, there's certain herding breeds that they're actually supposed to do that. That's how they cull or that's how they move different um, groups of animals into the specific location. So we're going to go a little into herding group and how these guys play. Take a second to uh, give us a quick chat of what breed um, your dog is and what group you think they're in. So we'll give you, let's just give you about 45 seconds to type that in. So if you have a terrier, if you have a border collie, if a German shepherd, let's see if you actually know what group or what category your dog is in. Julie, so, what's your dog in? Um, 
Opal Blossom is in the herding group because she's got some border collie sheepdog and another shepherd in there. Um, and then Cooper, that's a good question. I think that he would be a sporting group because he's a golden doodle. So um, sporting dogs are retrievers. They're ones that we like to go hunting with. So um, what do you think? I see well, the obviously it's, yeah, it's Bentley pretty. is a herding dog. He's an Australian <laughs> Shepherd mixed poodle. So he, um, and you can tell by the way he plays, you'll see a little bit later, he kind of whips his butt around. Um, and we use um, Bentley for our recalls. When I have puppies that come and I do a board and train, I can trust that Bentley will let the puppies go out and he'll circle them back around and bring them back. So it's an excellent way for me to be lazy and let him do all the training for me. So Definitely. Aria is a terrier. She's a pit bull terrier. Yeah, technically that's on the larger side of the terrier um, group, but definitely falls within that category. Husky Shepherd Mix, definitely in the working group. They were made to, to work, German Shepherd working group. Let's see, do we have any other ones? Um, Linda, do you know what uh, BB was made for? Do we have an Airedale example? We'll see. <laughs> I don't see your chatting, but um, okay. we'll always, we'll come back to that. So. So our breed groups, um, a herding dogs, this was uh, originally herding dogs were part of the working dog group because obviously they're working long hours out on big fields, um, but they recently split the group in 1983 because we had so many different breeds of shepherds um, and collies and all of those dogs that they really wanted to give them their own group to allow for more specificity when you're training or when you're um, working towards a goal with these dogs. Uh, herding dogs, obviously, Yo just described it. They love, love to round up things, whether that's chasing small children in a group, whether that's running out and grabbing the puppies and bringing them back. Um, Bentley, Yo's dog actually does something cool. If there's thing, if the puppies are getting a little wild in the house, if they're starting to play a little rough, he steps in in the middle and he kind of pushes them out of the way. So that's very typical. <laughs> Um, herding dogs, so not even necessarily using his mouth, but he's just using his body to block things, so stepping in when he needs to. Um, we have our examples, Border Collies, Old English Sheepdogs. Um, these dogs are amazing at problem solving, so they're meant to work in wide open spaces on their own time. Their owners send them out for 12 hours, they're running nonstop, they're working, 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 they come in, they grab a bite, and then they go back out. So um, it is easy to train these dogs, but you have to really be on it because they're such good problem solvers and independent thinkers that if they don't have a task or if they don't know what you want, they're going to go find something to do, and it's probably not going to be your favorite. So, so um, this is definitely a breed that we get a lot of calls about. Um, when there's a problem. And then when we go through the process of asking our consultation questions to come to find out that they don't give the dog enough outlet. So understanding your breed and understanding what specifically your dog is bred to do is really important when it comes to program design and designing your daily routine so that they can get what they need so they're not out there trying to figure out how they can get it themselves. Yeah, and even dogs that are rescued or adopted, you know, my um, my oldest is three years old now, and I did a DNA test on her when she was a baby just to know what kind of breeds that she would be, how big she would um, be, what her motivations for a lot of things were, and it was spot on, y'all. It is Border Collie Lab. We've got Husky and German Shepherd. She loves that kind of play and that um, working dog mentality, so... Um, very smart, very independent, high energy needs. So buyer beware, if you're not an experienced dog handler, um, this is going to give you a run for your money. We're out at the beach here. So this is um, Opal and Bentley, and then there's little Cooper running around as well. Um, Opal's chasing a bird. So Opal found a bird. She ran right out into the ocean, dive right in. And then when she comes back, I want you to watch Bentley here. Boom, boom, boom. Can you rewind that just for a second? So this right here is a very typical herding dog play, right? So you have the two jukes. He's trying to get her in a specific position. She bounced down and then they hit each other. 
right? So they're playing, but they're in full motion, um, which a lot of dogs don't necessarily do this while they're running. So this is very hurting. She's actually dogs. biting her knees too. And yep. what, when Bentley was a puppy, I had holes in every single one of my, my pants and tights because, you know, this was what he did. So um, a lot of ankle biting with this breed. We see a lot of that, right? A lot of complaints about this. Yeah, Aussies and um, Collies and Corgis use their mouth to herd. Um, Old English Sheepdogs and um, certain other like Pyrenees, they use their body, right? So not as many, so not as much of the nipping, but um, you'll see Opal's a big old football player. So she really likes to hit him and to move him in a direction. Um, so even within herding dogs, we have a lot of different styles of play. Um, they love, love, love fetch, chase, the flirt pole, which we went into last week, I think Yo had a demonstration of um, Molly using a flirt pole, loving take, drop, you know, leave it. All of those things are great to train with a herding dog because it's a lot of fun teaching the difference. So and just then, a small short walk would not do it for this dog. And consistently herding dogs are ranked number one in agility, in speed, um, th that's what they excel at because it allows for a creativity of problem solving as well as that physicality of running. So are these some of the, um, activities you would implement in a, with a client that had a border collie or an Aussie? Do you have fetch, chase, flirt pulls, agility? I would say depending on the age of the dog, definitely. So if they're a puppy, I would use chase to teach recall, right? I would run away from the dog and get them to chase after me and then starting to, you know, use that as a recall, come and then I'm staying still and they're coming and getting me. Um, those are really, really fun to, to get their attention. All you have to do is jump, really. That's what gets their attention and then they're like, I'm after you um definitely fetch those are that's my dog's favorite she if there's a ball in the area she's not doing anything else that's her task um, but not all dogs are going to like all of these activities so it's really up to the dog what they find most reinforcing so one thing doesn't work for all dogs so going into management uh, we have leashing versus tethering um, so most of our clients, when they first get a puppy, we talk about tether your dog when you can't keep an eye on them. Um, leashing, we have three different examples of what we use the leash for. We typically ask if you um, are in an open area, you would leash your dog with something like 15 to 30 feet to give them an opportunity to explore. Gives you an opportunity to see if your dog has a natural check-in. We wouldn't go from training a dog for six to eight months and then go, okay, let's totally fine off leash, let's go hiking. Probably won't come back <laughs> or the finest squirrel and take off. So having um, the ability to use a long leash to practice those skills before you really go out would be important. The eight to 10 foot leash is ideal for practicing recalls with all age dogs. So practicing on leash, those quick little recalls makes recalls fun and it implements that so it's part of their everyday routine. Um, I know that some cities have a law. I think one of our walkers just got a ticket for a, <laughs> or that was Laura, right? It was a warning. It was just a warning, but, yeah. but it is a real, it's, this is a law in, um, at least in Southern California, your dog must be on a maximum six foot leash. So when you're using these leashes, um, making sure that when we're in public spaces, there's other people around, you're starting to notice those animal control guys are rolling up. It's really important to shorten that leash so you have 100% control over your dog. Um, and then when you're in a wider solo space, like a baseball field, this just guarantees the recall. When it's time to go, we're headed out and it's going to keep um, you safe from any other off-leash dogs that may come through. Type of leash, um, there's lots of different types. So it depends on the size of your dog. Um, we had one dog that was a chewer in, in our class and uh, he, we had our normal size leash and he just like chewed right through it. So sometimes you might need a rope. So if you've got a terrier that likes to chew or you've got um, a dog that, um, you know, ha it works really well with his mouth, you might want to take a look at which type of leash you're using. But we do not recommend, what are those kind that, that go out really far and you push them? They're called retractable leashes, yeah. but I hate that because they don't 
retract, they only extend. So you have to reach out and grab this thin little line to pull your dog back in and who knows how that's gonna go. So let's just go ahead. If you have one of those, trash it, don't eat it, get rid of it. Yeah. Um, so the other side of using the leash is tethering. So um, this is, some people will say tying up. This is not tying up. We're not gonna leave our dogs while they're tethered. That's a really dangerous mistake that can go wrong very quickly. Um, especially, uh, you know, anecdotally, I had a dog that passed away that way when he got wrapped up in a line and no one was around. So um, making sure that you're always there to supervise whether you're tethering to a table because you're going out to eat or you're tethering to your belt. So you can see Yo here working with the Dalmatian Rocco. This dog is athletic. Like he can jump clear over both of our heads. So we need both hands to make sure that we're on it, that we're cueing it, that we're treating it, that we're keeping him engaged, but also that he doesn't get a step on us because he's, he's fast. Yeah. So um, if he has a cut, you know, if he has a lead of a couple of paws, we're going to lose him. We want to make sure that there's no chance of that happening in an open space. So having them tethered. So you can use both your hands. So when you're working outside with your dog on loose leash walking or targeting um, this way that you can use both of your hands at one time. Um, if your dog is tethered and they're actively chewing on the leash, they may, there's a lot of different reasons they could be doing that. They might be bored. They may have too much energy. They've been, um, they're getting overstimulated. There's too many lights and people and food and that kind of thing. So making sure one, that they're set up in a really nice, comfortable space with a bed or a blanket and something else to put their mouth on. You can see down here at the very bottom, um, check out our resources page where we have some of our favorite chews uh, listed under our favorites. Um, but those are going to be the long lasting things that satisfy your dog's stress chewing rather than, oh, I'm going to bite off this leash and run away and see what I can get into. We had a client's dog do that lately. They turned away for a couple of minutes and the puppy was all the way down the hall and they had no idea. So um, yeah. making sure that the leash is an appropriate thickness as well for um, your puppy's sharp, sharp teeth. But for an older dog, if they're uncomfortable, they're going to show you some signs of discomfort. Uh, one more thing about when we have our puppies and we have them tethered, we use that to help teach the dog to follow you. And um, it's an opportunity if you are tethering your dog in, in the afternoon and you see that your dog sits when you sit. If you're on the phone, they go into a laying down position. It's an opportunity to, for you to reinforce that behavior that we so want. So if you can have your dog with you throughout the afternoon, once you've come home and you're just trying to relax, it's a great way to reinforce the behavior that we like. Or if you're just trying to keep them in a general area, that's, yeah, that's how yeah, we do that. You have, Yo has a really uh, a nice open space house. So whenever we need the dogs to stay in one area, there's not a lot of walls or doors. So we tether them um, to the table or under our feet so that we can know where they are. <laughs> So the difference, we hear the words spot, place, crate, settle, mark, table. I'm going to go through each of them and how we use them. Every single human is different and you're going to use it for what applies to you. So spot and place to us means it's a temporary hold. Stay right there. It won't take long. Let me go do this. I'll be right back. So we use spot or place and we're asking the dog to go into a sit or down, it doesn't even matter as long as they stay there until we release them. We can use this when we're, and we'll show you a little bit later when we're going to the front door because someone's at the door. Or if you're going into the kitchen to go get them their food, we want them to go to a spot or place so that we can go get their food. Typically what it looks like is a bath rug or a rug or a little carpet. It's something that's already laid down. You're not laying something down and then telling them to go to the spot. It's already on your floor. Um, you can use it if you're going into a grocery store, or not a grocery store, I guess that's that pet store. You would say, go to your spot or hold on, you know, stay right there. And then you can go do something and come back. For service animals, we also use that, but we don't use spot or place. We just use sit because we've got to go do something and come back. Crate, we all know uh, what a crate is, but we actually cue crate, we cue place or spot, 
and we teach it exactly the same way. If I say, go to your crate, it means go into your house, turn around and lay down. That's the end behavior of crate. So go in, turn all the way around, lay down, and then we will reward you there. We also use a cue called table. Table just, um, we use this um, in our training school dogs. To, that means get up on the platform and sit. We like to use this to teach dogs that it's to go into like a veterinarian office and they're gonna go get weighed. What else do we use this? We use this as places like, go to your place for a second, go to your table. It's not your turn, just hold on a second. Well, for our senior clients, sometimes the table can be useful if they need to leash their dog or put the harness on so that they don't have to bend all the way over to the floor, their dog comes up to them. So um, it's not just used for agility or for really cute pictures. It's also can be really practical if you don't have a very good back um, or you're, you just can't uh -huh. bend down for those really tiny terriers that a lot of people have. Mark, um, the behavior looks like when you call Mark for a dog, um, it's specifically used for like acting or dogs that are in um, photo shoots and things. They stay on their mark no matter what's going on. So once we teach the dog that behavior, the distractions that we use with that particular cue is cameras, lights, um, video, cam you know, like everything going by, they stay on their mark no matter what's going on in the scene. So. We don't use that a lot with our school dogs. We had a couple dogs that have gone through a program that have gone on to do um, that type of training, um, but specifically Mark is used to just for mostly acting and dogs that are in photo shoots. Settle is our most common one. We absolutely use settle for every uh, one of our dogs that goes through our program. Settle means go lay down. I'm gonna lay you out this particular blanket, towel, whatever it is lay down, relax, maybe even fall asleep because it's going to be a while. So settle. Maria, Nisha, I see you on the board. Um, this is your dog's absolute favorite thing in the world. And I know you know it, this is our favorite game. So. so most of the dogs in our program go through a lot, you know, they get through a lot of levels on settle. There's a lot before they can actually just lay down no matter what's going on. So in the next couple of videos, we're gonna show you some of the distractions that we work through with our dogs. And we're gonna show you how to teach your dog and how to continue training even when you're at home. So go to your spot. We talked about that earlier. Spot and place to us in our school program is exactly the same, but you can call different spots or places in your house different names. So if you have a carpet by your front door, you can call that spot. If you have a, a, a little bed, um, actually we have go to your bed too. If you have another little carpet in your kitchen, you can call that place. It's whatever you can remember and whatever you'd like to use in your own home. That's a good point. You pick something that you remember and a word that you're gonna use consistently. <laughs> yeah. And if all else fails, there's another one that we use that just means you point to it and that's another way of <laughs> go there. All right. So for go to your spot, we use this in our training dogs and with our private clients, and it means go to particular spots. So in this video, um, we have Julie knocking on the door, and this is the end behavior. This is what it's supposed to look like, and then we're going to show you how to train. So knock, knock, knock. The human tells the dog to go to the spot, and the dog can sit or lay down. We reward the dog for doing that. And then there's your stay, right? And they've got to build that distraction. The door opens, the dog still stays until they're released. Notice that we place the treat placement right between the two paws. The door is open, completely open, and um, you can talk to your, to your dog. Now, a lot of dogs cannot do that. That's way too hard. So we're going to go through the steps on how to do that and then we're going to show you the next video, which is how to build, how to get through distraction, duration, and um, distance, which is all three, right? That's really hard to get through all three. So the setup for go to your spot for the door is you want to make sure that they're not alarming the dogs. So we specifically tell our clients, place something on your door so that you can get this going. Something on the door that says, hold on, you know, text me instead so that the 
the doorbell or the knocking of the door doesn't make your dog react. And I live in an apartment complex, so that's especially important because I have a large dog that makes a big noise. So um, letting other people know, I have Girl Scouts come and tap, 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 do you want some cookies? I mean, that's, it's better than ringing the doorbell and knocking constantly. I'd rather them think twice about it um, than, than set my whole house off. To set this up for training, you're gonna put your leash on the door knob, whatever your knob looks like. You're gonna have that sign on the front and then you're going to ask somebody to come over that you know that will text you. So they're gonna text you, you get your text message, there's already a leash on the door and all you're gonna do is go up to the door, unlock it, grab the leash and then cue your dog to go into a place. So unlock the door, leash the dog, cue place, and spot or spot. So this is for someone that you guys know that you're gonna unlock the door, go take care of your dog. And then when you're practicing, you'll say, okay, come on in. Um, this is how again, you train it. And yeah, practice, practice. Wise, yeah, they're manage it wise. He's holding on to the leash and he's not going to the door because that's too hard for some of our dogs. You stay back with your dog, you keep your dog leashed, and you just tell them to come on in. Doors open, they come on in, and you stay with your dog. That's how you would train, go to your spot, and how you would practice it and build the skill set it takes for your dog to actually stay there. So using management to set your dog up for success, right? We don't want your dog to fail while they're learning. So if you just open that door big and wide and they get up, you're going to get frustrated. They're going to get frustrated. So using management to make sure that you're successful along the way. So that's what it looks like. And that's how you would typically train. It. So now we're going to go into how to train spot, place, crate, settle, go to your bed, table, all taught exactly the same way, but you're putting a different cue on each one, if that's your choice. Otherwise, you can just right. point. And making sure that you as the owner know what that looks like. Before you know yeah, you right. do want to have a game plan ahead of time. <laughs> right, so what does Matt mean? What does that mean? So this is the different types of spots. So here we have just laying down while you eat, it's duration. We have training a dog to go into a bag. We call this crate. We have going into a big crate. All of those are all taught the exact same way. It just looks different, right? It's a different object and whether it's sitting or down or laying down, And that's you can see these practice. dogs are so motivated to hold still, right? That's, that's crazy, but they're really, really excited to get there and then see how long they can hold it. I'm gonna go over the steps in a second, but you can see here, this is uh, three, three of our school dogs and they have already gone through the first four levels of settle. This is settle, each blanket was laid down, the dog goes to the blanket and now we're working past duration and we're working with distance and there are distractions of the other dogs right next to them. So this is what our training looks like. So we're doing what we call working the clock. So the reward, go ahead, sorry, Julie. So as we're increasing one, there's more distractions. We're gonna decrease the other ones. We're gonna, they're walking less distance away from their dog. They're treating more frequently. So the duration is a little bit shorter. Um, just making sure that you're adjusting. You're not trying to go all the way to the end and say, my dog is amazing. We want you to really build that foundation so it lasts a long it time. It takes months to get all the way through all those levels of settle on a map. So to begin any kind of spot mark, you know, any place that you, anything that you want to train that's got to do with an object, you're going to first 
try to pick up the object and you're gonna put it down. If you have a placemat or a bed or a crate that's already there, then you're gonna walk over to it and you simply look at it. By looking at it, you make the object pretty enticing or important. So the dog will naturally go over and go that, I'm curious, what is that? So that's the very first step is make it interesting. You're gonna walk over and you're gonna look at it. Once your dog engages in any way, and that means looking at it, sniffing it, moving forward, you're gonna mark. That's where Julie said about the clicker. And then we're going to toss the treat away to reset the dog. Now this takes sometimes in one sitting, we can do it in like 30 seconds and do, you know, go through a few of these, or sometimes it takes days to get them to go. But the first step is getting the dog interested in going to the object or the, the thing that we're trying to be trying to um, train. So after we get some engagement, we go to one paw. So we're going to delay. We're going to wait, wait, wait. And then there's two paws. We're going to mark and we're tossing the treat to, to reset the dog. Three paws, four, sit, then down. So if you're training a go to your spot, and your dog sits, that's it, you're done. That is the end of what you want, the goal behavior, what you want your dog to do. In this case, settle for us means lay down and possibly relax. So we're gonna keep going. Once you hit your goal, it's time to put it on cue. So but at this point, not before you hit that goal, so. Don't keep saying settle, 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 and your dog's looking at you like, what do you mean if they're not at that point yet? So once now, um, this is Angelo. He's an Australian Labradoodle that we've worked with. He is now on the bed or on the settle mat and he is laying down. We finished, now we can add the cue. Now for settle, getting onto the blanket is the first step. After we get on the blanket, we'd like to get them to stay on the blanket, right? So we typically, if we're using a clicker, we ditch the clicker at this point because we wanna teach the dog to relax. And most of our working dogs, when it's time to work, they kind of have this like adrenaline rush and they're, you know, I'm so interested, what are you doing? So we like to ditch the clicker, we move a little bit slower, and we wait for more of a relaxed state. So here at this point, we would begin adding the three Ds. Now we typically start with duration first. We don't move, we stay right there next to the settle mat, and once they get on, instead of tossing the treat, we're give, gonna give them three treats in a row to get a little bit of duration. We do that maybe three or four times, and then we work at the next D, which is, I think we have a distance. Distance. For distance, we do working the clock, where we slightly move away, we come back, we pay the dog. You'll notice that treat placement, we usually pay right between the two paws. <laughs> or if we need the dog to move their head away from a trigger, we might place it on you know, the left or right pole to get their head to move. So small do movement have, away. Huh? If you have a sneaky dog like Mr. Angelo here, you can see his elbows are hovering right there. You can treat a little bit to the side to have them, boom, wrap that hip, hip over where he is now. And now we know that he's going to be there for a while. So building, uh, we've gone through duration and this is now just the distance work. You notice that there's no distractions. There's no other dogs next to them. We do this one at a time. And then we start to add distractions and you want to go through distractions that you really are going to use. So in this case, Julie is working with Cooper trying to get him to stay in a subtle position while she works on a computer. So we had to work getting in your chair, right? Moving your chair. Those are all major distractions for a dog. They're just, they, it's not something that's normal to them. Yeah, especially big, loud, um, elevated chairs, right? She has a wooden floor. So sometimes when you move them, they, or the big boom, when you finally sit down, 
um, all of those can take your dog out of the moment and they can surprise them. So we want to make sure that um, Treat placement, really important here. Also, you know, again, two paws down. And after you're getting some duration and you're working through some distractions, keeping their head down is important. So before they look up to look at you, because again, we're trying to get the dog to rel relax on settle. Before they come up, you're treating them again to keep their head down. So we go back to that first one where we were talking about, you know, working the door, you know, when you're going out to the door, we have um, a couple clients that requested some help when they're leaving. So in this video, it, we have four flights of stairs. We have Bentley in the same subtle position or it can be a place or spot, but we're working moving away down the stairs towards the real door that you're normally leaving out of. So it's small steps away, come on back and pay. So Curtis did this for about 15, 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> I was cracking up because it was a good little- It's a good workout. Hey, if you're stuck at home and you have stairs, this is a great human workout and a dog workout. They have to stay still and you have to get buffed, so. All right, so we'll skip through that. Uh, one more point when you're working on your three Ds, you're doing one of those at a time. Here's the distraction of the door. So first he's touching the door, then he's turning the door. He's not just opening the door all the way up. That's too hard for most dogs. So small steps, slicing it nice and thin. Don't test your dog. Find where you know for sure that they can actually do it and you're gonna be successful. So even here, he's moving his shoulder out and shutting the door, taking a half step out and shutting the door. So taking it step by step, if your door is locked, so unlocking the door, then touching the knob. Um, think about the smallest steps that you could possibly take and do all of those before you ever open the door. All right. Yay, so here's my sweet girl, Opal Blossom. Um, your homework this week is to teach settle on a mat um, in whatever area in your house that you think it would be most useful. If that's settling outside of the kitchen, if it's next to your desk, if you're working from home right now, um, this is a great opportunity now that we're all in the house all the time to teach and really work on this particular skill. Um, teach go to your spot. So having, you can call it whatever you like, spot, place, bed, you know, moon, I don't really care, but pick one word and use it to mean one particular place. And that's how you're going to train your dog to go to there when you need them to, or you can just point. That's also another option. If you can't remember the word, don't confuse your dog. Um, settle on a mat. You're going to pack your lunch and you're going to either go out to the park, go grab a coffee out on a patio. Um, I know we're all a little paranoid, but you can still maintain social distance and your dog can help you, right? They're a good six foot, or at least mine is. They have to stay a good six foot away from me if I have a big 80 pound dog with me. So um, then uh, we'd really love to see a two minute video. So please don't send us, you know, an hour long training session, but we want to see you guys doing these things out in the real world, whether it's in your house, in the park, or you go to a coffee shop, send us an example. And um, we'd love to see how you're doing and maybe give you some feedback on how to advance. Or just a picture. You can always just submit a picture. Or just a picture. Yeah, we want to see you guys out in the real world working. So to review, um, we talked about training tools. We talked about the different kinds of toys and putting them away so that your dog doesn't have access to them all day long. Um, Julie talked about breed specific play and we talked this time about herding dogs and we'll try to hit all the different types of breeds. Um, uh, so Nisha excellent question in our question and answer section. So practicing at a dinner table can work up to a restaurant visit. Is that a good progression? Absolutely. So starting in the home where there's less distractions and then building up, you don't go to second street right away. You may go to a park cafe and then you're starting to work into those really busy shopping centers or um, going traveling and traveling with your dog. So great question. And if you have a question, if you want to write down what your shaping plan or what that might look like, what you're thinking, you can always write it and send it to us personally 
Um, you can use our Facebook page to ask those kind of questions and we can give you that feedback immediately versus just trying it. So if you have any doubt that your dog might not succeed, um, give us a call or text us and see if we can talk you through it. Uh, last, we went through spot, place, settle, and crate. Hopefully now you know the difference and how you can incorporate that in your daily life. Um, we went through all the different steps of settle on a mat. Remember that you're gonna first get the dog to the spot, place, crate, bed, you know, whatever you wanna call it. And then you're gonna add the duration, distraction, distance, or distance, direct, you know, whatever, but one at a time, not trying to do all three at once. All right. Any questions, feel free to use your chat button to ask us a question. Otherwise, we will take this recording. We'll send you a link uh, later on tonight or first thing tomorrow so you have a copy of it. And any of the videos that we shared on this, um, on this platform, we're going to cut out separately so that you can kind of dissect them and use them as needed. So Julie, any questions on there before we sign off? Um, I think we had just the one from Nisha. Thank you for um, using your question opportunity. But if you, again, if you guys have any other questions, please send them to us um, and, and a video or a picture of you guys working with your dog. Yes. All right. All right. If there's nothing else, um, we'll see you guys next week. We'll be here again, Tuesday, 530. Um, and we'll be going over some new and interesting topics. So make sure you tune in each week. All right. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, guys.